for joining us today and welcoming us, welcome to our 16th Horizon Series webinar. I'm Jean Howden. Elric initiated this series of webinars as part of our mission to help create a better future for the livestock value chain. The topics covered in this webinar series are having and will have direct impact on the future of Ontario's livestock sector. Today's webinar will be posted in the next few days. During the presentation, please send your questions along with using the Q&A function. And following the presentation, my colleague, Kelly Somervelt will bring questions forward for discussion. I'm pleased now to introduce Dr. Mike Lauhaus for today's webinar. He received his bachelor and PhD from the University of Guelph, where he became an assistant professor in animal breeding. He left that position and worked at the Monsanto Company USA, leading programs in animal and plant genomics, statistics, patent science, and environmental modeling. His current position is the Vice President Research and Innovation at the CMEX Alliance, a global dairy and beef breeding company with sales of genetic pro products and services worldwide. CMEX actively utilizes genetic, genomic, and reproductive technologies to accelerate genetic progress for production, health, and economic traits in cattle. To provide insight into genetic editing, and specifically genetic editing in livestock, welcome Dr. Lohas. Thank you, Jean. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, what I would like to start with uh, just is a little explanation of the, uh, the title slide here. Um, CMEX is celebrating our 50th year uh, of operations um, as the CMEX Alliance. And uh, there's a lot of history there you'll see on the slides and a few, uh, a few recognizable images like uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau visiting our barns uh, in a few decades ago. So this, what the presentation is about will be looking at comparison of gene editing with other methods of genetic modification, very briefly. Uh, some examples of gene editing in animals, um, common approaches that we would use in breeding programs, and a checklist of considerations, both technical and uh, non-technical, uh, as well as uh, some view over the, the regulatory environment, um, and then scenarios where gene editing makes sense, at least to me. Uh, what um, this is not going to be about is really digging into the gene editing methodologies themselves, um, some of the developing methods. So there's some new things coming out that are quite interesting, fascinating, but I won't be talking about those. Not really going to be talking about gene editing in crops or humans uh, or gene therapy or gene drives uh, or ethical aspects of gene editing. These are really interesting topics, but they would be almost webinars in themselves. Uh, I did have a link in this slide that um, points to a workshop um, that took place in February that actually is really useful. Uh, it's, uh, it covers a lot of ground from the technical to the regulatory to the practical, and uh, it, it spans two days. Um, well, that was the National Academy of Sciences that took place in Washington. So uh, if you want to learn more about gene editing, that's a great place and a great uh, source. So just uh, some of the differences between genomic selection, because um, some people think genomic selection is actually editing and it's not. Um, and GMOs and gene editing are different, although there are some overlaps. So genomic selection is really just an extension of traditional selection. Um, it uses the connection between the genotype and the phenotype. It a, creates a statistical association that you can use to make selection based on the DNA alone, rather than having to wait for the phenotype on all animals. So there's no actual changes or modifications being made to the genome. It's We make use of natural mutations that occur in the genome. Now, genetically modified organisms is very different. It involves a random insertion of genes or what we call DNA constructs from one species to another, which makes it a transgenic. Um, and uh, one, one thing that's quite important is the word random because uh, when GMOs um, are done, there was really no ability to target 
a gene or a gene construct into where it would incorporate into the into the genome. And so sometimes it incorporated in unusual places, places that it did it was silent or sometimes it was uh, overexpressed. Um, and uh, it could lead to um, you know un, unexpected uh, consequences in expression or non-expression. So it really wasn't um, very targeted. Uh, so gene editing changed all that where it involves a targeted uh, insertion or deletion or modification of the genome in a li living organism. And I point out there's cisgenic and transgenic. Cisgenic really just means that you're using DNA that already exists in the species of question, whereas transgenic is uh, using uh, DNA that does not exist in the in the species. So that would be uh, something that you would never see happen in nature. Whereas cisgenic, some of these deletions or insertions or modifications could happen through regular breeding um, or natural selection. So just another comment about, uh, or a further explanation about genomic selection and the way it works, uh, you'll see at the top, there's a reference population. So this is a large number of animals that represent the larger population, but it's a, it's a, it's a population that you have phenotypes and genotypes. Today, we use thousands of SNPs. Um, today in the, in the dairy world, we're using a, a SNP chip of 100,000 SNPs. Um, and for research purposes, we can go up from there. But that's a, you can also use a smaller number that uh, represents uh, the genome fairly well as well. So what you hope to get out of that reference population is an association between the SNPs or the markers and the phenotypes. And what you develop from there, from those statistical associations, is a prediction equation so that future animals where you've only got the DNA and you only have a marker uh, profile, you can use those predictions, uh, prediction equations to predict the phenotype or come up with a, a genomic estimated breeding value. So a GEBV is a genomic estimated breeding value. And so that saves a lot of time. Uh, it's revolutionized the, the dairy breeding world because uh, our generation intervals have gone from three to four years down to two years or less. So it's it's really um, essentially uh, doubled or sometimes more than doubled the genomic progress uh, in, in, our, in our breeds. All right, so moving on to GMOs, this is uh, probably the most famous example is the Aqua Bounty salmon. Um, you know, it, it, the first GMO is approved in, uh, in crops uh, probably in, uh, nine, I want to say 2005, um, and it was, I'm sorry, it was uh, 1995, somewhere around there, don't quote me, uh, but it was 20 years later essentially before uh, aqua bounty salmon was approved in um, in animals. So what this was uh, essentially was transferring the growth hormone gene from the Chinook salmon to the Atlantic salmon. And what that allowed was this, uh, this salmon, the GMO salmon was able to grow a lot faster. Um, this was kind of an unfortunate picture because you see the one uh, being much larger. These are uh, the, these are salmon of the same age, uh, but the GMO salmon grew much faster. In, in actual fact, they grew to the same size. The GMO salmon just got there faster with a lot less feed, a lot less uh, you know, time in a pen. So there was less feed, less overhead, uh, less infrastructure required. Um, but the way this was interpreted was these were monster fish. <laughs> and that was not the case. So I thought it was just a, an unfortunate picture that really got latched onto. Um, this was approved for sale in Canada, USA, Brazil, as also the uh, the facilities that were used to produce them. It is sold um, in Samuels, as an example, uh, Samuels and Sun Seafood in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware. Uh, I think it was also made available for sale in Florida. Um, some companies, uh, Costco, Walmart, Kroger, Whole Foods, they've said that they do not sell GMO or clone salmon. 
Uh, if they do, it would be labeled as such. So that was interesting that some of those big chains chose to not market it, which shows you some of the um, some of the challenges uh, that GMO has faced. Now, gene editing, there's, uh, I think, more examples uh, in animals that we can look at. Uh, the Galsafe pig uh, was really, um, it was an edit that was meant to reduce a, a sugar on the surface of cells that was causing allergenicity in some humans. Uh, but it was also realized that if you could remove or shut down uh, that gene uh, for that expression of, of that particular sugar, then you have a greater chance of uh, using these organs for xenotransplantation because there'd be less chance of rejection by the patient. Uh, you've probably all heard of the glowfish. Uh, that was really just to turn on a fluorescent gene in the fish, which was kind of done for fun. There was no um, uh, concern for the environment. It was usually used in uh, aquariums. Um, then we get into animals, uh, farm animals. Exelogen uh, created the hornless cattle. Uh, so it was a, a pole gene substitution. They used the Celtic pole gene and substituted that uh, in that. Uh, so this was, a, this was a polled animal that already exists in the species. So it was uh, not considered, uh, it was more of a cisgenic uh, gene edit rather than a transgenic gene edit. We'll get into that more in a bit. Uh, this was an animal welfare issue, uh, albeit uh, probably hard to explain to consumers because then you would have to explain uh, what dehorning uh, or disbudding is. And so that was uh, made it a little bit more difficult. There's also uh, Exelogen came out with the slick cattle. Again, the slick gene exists already in the species uh, in some breeds that are not known for milk production, but they are more heat tolerant. Uh, there was also a BVD resistant cow that was produced by USDA Mark. Um, uh, another one uh, that was quite interesting was Washington State University's uh, nano two knockout, which uh, allowed them to create surrogate sires. And what that did was shut down sperm production of the surrogate sire. And you could then transplant uh, stem cells into the testes to produce uh, sperm from a more elite sire. So, so this is still ongoing, uh, but it's, a, it's another interesting example. Uh, and finally, the, the CD163 knockout um, by Genus PIC to create PERS uh, tolerant pigs. Uh, so this is an animal health issue. We have uh, $2.7 billion of cost to the industry because of PERS tolerant pig, PERS uh, um, intolerant pigs. <laughs> so uh, there's there are vaccines, but they don't work very well. So it doesn't have a, you know, a traditional solution. Uh, so this is a, a very um, interesting example. Um, this was submitted for FDA approval in the USDA. And as I understand, it's uh, getting close to the time where FDA could approve this. Now, where does that gene edit go? Uh, it could be uh, into the zygote. So this often means embryos editing. You can use different ways of introducing the edit through a viral vector or microinjection or electroporation, which means you just shock it so that the, um, the, the uh, gene edit uh, gets incorporated where you want it. Um, um, the, the approach that was used with the hornless cow uh, was uh, the somatic cell editing. So they were able to edit uh, non-germline cells uh, but this does require an additional step of uh, cloning. So you're taking that uh, edited somatic cell and you're introducing it into an enucleated oocyte. So you're introducing it into a germline cell that can then be used for breeding. Now in the chicken industry, they have the ability to um, edit primordial germ cells and uh, those uh, can be cultured in vitro and are they have the ability to incorporate into the germline. So, so that's a, an advantage for chickens at this point. Um, so, and that would be ideal. Um, now, um, 
there's different levels of edits. There's the insertion uh, or deletion, call, uh, commonly called an indel. The other approach is more homology-directed repair. So it means you're taking uh, constructs and you're you're incorporating or substituting DNA that's already there. Um, now, there's a variety of outcomes that it's important to know about. Um, the, the edit can be one base pair, single base pair, or it could be up to or over uh, a thousand base pairs. Um, what can happen is you can get an edit to one allele, but not the other. So, or you could have both alleles uh, are edited. Um, and you could have alleles, like you could have each allele could be edited, but by a different edit. So it's not exactly totally homozygous because there's slightly different edits um, on, on the different allele. Um, mosaicism is a common problem when you choose to edit an embryo because there's no guarantee that you're going to edit or be able to transform all the cells in the embryo. Uh, if you're, let's say, at the two or four cell stage, you know, you might edit, you know, half of those cells. Um, and so what you could end up with is um, the somatic cells are edited or the germline cells are edited or a bit of both. Um, that makes a problem. But let's say the germline cells are only 50% edited. Um, you won't get, uh, you won't get uh, edited sperm on 100% of the sperm it will be, uh, it'll be a fraction of it. So in those cases, if you wanna have a homozygous uh, application, you would probably need to select uh, another generation. So um, it just adds time. You, of course, you can get unexpected insertions or deletions. Um, and so that's something that has to be checked for. You can get off-target edits. Uh, they're getting better in terms of targeting uh, the, the desired site for incorporation. But if there's another site in the genome that is similar in the genomic sequence uh, for the targeting um, for, for the location where you want to target, uh, you could get edits in, in those places as well. And things can happen, you know, in, uh, in, in the way these edits are done. So you could get a an insertion in the right place, but it could be rearranged, it could be flipped. Um, or of course you can get uh, exactly what you want and there's no unexpected modification. Uh, one of the things that's very fortunate, I think, is that we have the ability to sequence these animals at greater and greater depth, which means we will be able to pick up these unexpected edits or anything that could go wrong. Uh, and that is becoming par for the course. If you're going to go down the gene editing route, you're going to expect to have to do a lot of sequencing to make sure that things are working the way they're supposed to. All right, so uh, just some examples of the indel approach, uh, the PERS resistant pig that I talked about. Um, it's, uh, it's really just uh, shutting down uh, or uh, basically knocking out. Um, it's it's really just the receptor for the virus. So there's a, a part of a, the CD163 gene that is knocked out, and that prevents the virus from having any place that it can recognize in the genome. And so that makes the pig resistant. Um, and um, this uh, does um, make, uh, I think, for a lot of checks that need to be done. So you need to make sure that um, that, uh, that 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 is done correctly. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. There's also the, um, the surrogate sire, again, the Nanos 2 knockout. So this was another indel approach. Um, the other was the uh, homologous uh, homology directed repair. So the hornless dairy cattle gene uh, did uh, use this approach. And so the Celtic uh, allele had to be, uh, had to replace uh, what was there in the typical breed, like a Holstein, for example. Um, the same was, could be said for the BVD um, resistant cow. So that was, uh, again, editing the CD46 gene. All right, so 
that leads to the checklist. So, um, you know, technical considerations that a company would need to take into account is are there off target or unexpected edits? Um, did the edit happen in the germline or did it happen in the somatic uh, cell edit? Uh, was it a somatic cell that got edited? Is there germline transmission, which is really what we want in breeding? And uh, of course, mosaicism is something if it if it is mosaic, then we're going to need to have another generation. Um, one thing that isn't talked about that much is the efficiency of the edit, uh, how many animals or how many embryos would need to be edited to actually get something stable that you need. Um, and so I, you know, we want to have stable founder animals that can be used to uh, improve the genome. All right, so um, this global regulatory status uh, for gene editing is very different around the world. There's a there's a site called the Genetic Literacy Project Global Gene Editing Tracker, and so you can click on every country and see what the status is, and it's it's going to tell you something like this table tells you that there's a rating of zero to ten, zero being prohibited entirely, to ten being uh, there's no real unique regulations, um, and so. The uh, category 10 would include countries like Brazil, Argentina, Ecuador, Paraguay. Uh, Canada is listed as lightly regulated along with Japan and Australia. Um, I think this might be a slightly biased site because um, the Genetic Literacy Project um, wants to really promote the fact that USDA is behind other countries and so it ranks lower in the list. But seriously, um, you know, in Canada, it's not easy. We would have to get, um, still, we, we'd have to get approvals. Um, it's, of course, a lot easier if the uh, edit is not novel. So if that gene is already existing in the species, um, in theory, there should be less difficulty. Um, I thought it was useful. Um, there's a slide from Diane Ray Kayan uh, for USDA that she presented last year. It shows, you know, anywhere from, um, you know, the, the top of the chart, which is sort of natural mutations or mutagenesis, would be considered non-GMO. Um, we're at the very bottom. If you have a recombinant DNA insertion from a foreign species, that would be considered GMO. And then everything in between would be considered genome editing. So small. Uh, changes or deletions or a short template or a long template that's uh, cisgenic, which means it's coming from the species itself, or uh, even a transgenic repair. So in other words, you could take a sequence from another species and use gene editing to uh, incorporate that transgene. It's not, it's done targeted, uh, it's not random, uh, but it would essentially um, be a transgenic. Whether it would be regulated as a GMO or as an edit, I think um, is still up for debate. Um, and uh, this was just showing the GMO on the left and the non-GMO or no, uh, novel breeding techniques on the right. Uh, you can see that um, there's more animals represented. 25% of these would be farm or aquatic animals. Um, so it looks like editing uh, has a lower barrier for animals um, and GMOs. Uh, there are a couple of exa examples of GMO animals, um, but they, for some reason, didn't show up on this chart. Um, there are some examples of unrealized opportunities of animal genetic engineering, or recombinant DNA technologies. There's a mastitis resistant cow uh, that the USDA created. This was a tremendous value. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why it didn't go forward. Um, and then there was the Enviro pig in Canada uh, that was, uh, you know, going to reduce the environmental footprint, um, you know, by introducing the phytase gene into the pig's genome. Uh, again, that didn't make it for a variety of reasons. So there was a very high regulatory barrier at the time for for a GMO animal, and uh, I think uh, it was a long path that. I don't think uh, that the University of Guelph um, and those involved were probably prepared for. So it did not make it to market. Um, so when does gene editing make sense? 
um, if it solves a thorny problem, so uh, like a disease risk. So uh, there's environmental production or adaptation to climate change, disease, pest control, animal welfare, food, health, safety. Those are all great reasons. Um, if there's a low heritability uh, trait or if there's no genetic variation, then you can't breed for it if, if it's very low heritability or if there's no genetic variation. So in that case, you know, you could consider gene editing. There has to be significant value. There, it has to be easily explainable to consumers. Um, there has to be possible regulatory path. Um, you have to have IP protection and the size of the market has to be large enough to recoup your investment. So an example, uh, I think that fits that bill is the PERS resistant pig. Um, it does uh, solve a thorny, thorny problem. Um, there, you know, as I mentioned, there, there are vaccines, but they don't work very well. So it, it ticks that box. There is significant value, um, $2.7 billion worth of value to the industry. Uh, is it easily explainable to consumers? I think the jury's still out on whether consumers will understand this. Uh, but I think if you can say the um, the pig, uh, it protects the pig from disease and suffering, I think that will go a long ways. Um, there's certainly a regulatory path already in place. There's an IP position and the size of the market is huge. I included a slide that came from a genus presentation, which um, just illustrates that once you have the gene, it still takes a long time to introduce it so it gets all the way to market level. Pig industry, there's a breeding pyramid, so it takes a while to get all the way through, in this case, approximately 10 years to have a homozygous uh, pig at the market level. So it has to work its way through the pyramid, going from heterozygous to homozygous. So it, it does take a lot of time. So when doesn't gene editing make sense? Well, if it introduces additional risk to animals or consumers, it's kind of like a non-starter. Um, if the same modification is possible via conventional means or breeding, um, you have to answer some more questions as to why you would want to do gene editing. Um, is there a perceived risk to animals or the end user or a consumer? The regulatory burden is too high. Um, if there is minimal freedom to operate. If someone else has a patent, a key patent, that's going to be a problem. And if it's too costly or difficult to bring to market. Uh, so what will the GE landscape look like in uh, in five to 10 years? I This is my opinion here, but uh, I don't think we can expect a tsunami of gene, edited, uh, gene editing approvals, uh, but you will see gradual regulatory approvals in, in several key markets. Um, key markets like the USA, the regulatory burden is likely to remain high, but there are exceptions to that that are possible. And there's a something called a discretionary enforcement, which lowers the burden for non-novel phenotypes. If you know the phenotype already exists, then um, you know the the U.S. regulators would consider that to have a lower risk. Um, so early edits uh, will probably mimic traits with existing phenotypes. So in other words, so cisgenic uh, edits, um, gradual initiation of these gene editing projects will start with major players because they can afford to start this. But um, I don't think it's going to be limited to major players because the barriers are not as large as for GMOs. First applications, of course, in high value, large market scenarios. Um, most useful for traits with no current solutions and consumer appeal. Um, and companies will search for germline editing solutions like they have in chickens. All right, so concluding, uh, gene editing is a more exact and powerful form of genetic engineering than GMOs uh, and likely more accepted. Uh, several examples of gene edit already exist in animals, but the field is progressing more slowly than in crops. Unexpected results from gene editing can occur and require significant diligence to achieve only the expected edit and technical hurdles I think remain around transforming germline cells. The regulatory burden is likely to remain high and companies will only invest in, and make that investment if the, the trait has high value and broad market appeal. So I'll stop there and leave my contact information on the, the slide for a second or two here.
All right, great. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Loheis. This was uh, a really fantastic presentation. It's uh, certainly a, a timely issue, especially when we consider the tremendous potential that you've laid out for this technology. And um, certainly appreciate you breaking down what's what is a very complex topic and um, making it really applicable to the livestock sector. We have a few questions in the chat, so as we go through to answer them, I'll just be moving them over. But before we get into that, I do have a question that I'm personally curious to know, and I'm just wondering if there is a specific edit that you yourself are most excited to see, either something you're aware of that's in the works or just something from your imagination that's yet to be put into practice. But is there one that you'd really like to see or be excited for? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, despite the fact that Genus is a competitor of ours, I am rooting for this because uh, I think it's a great example of a responsible use of gene editing. There's a, there's a huge need for, uh, and I used to work in the pig industry, and PERS, uh, the PERS virus was, a, was devastating. It was a huge waste, and um, we had to depopulate our nucleus because of PERS. So, um, you know, this would be a... a a huge benefit and a great example of how gene editing can do things that regular breeding can't. So I'm I'm personally rooting for that one. I love that answer. All right, so we'll move some uh, questions over here, and uh, we've got one in um, the chat here. So the regulation and acceptance of gene editing in plants is far ahead of that in livestock. What do you, why do you think that is, and how do you see livestock catching up? Uh, yeah, well, I I went from the animal industry to the plant industry at one point in my career and then back again. Uh, and one thing that impressed me was that uh, the plant industry is huge. Uh, there's huge number of acres. There's a lot of value in creating seed for uh, for crop production. Uh, so those, the scale um, means that, you know, there's a lot more money for research, a lot more money for um, regulatory approvals and submissions. So that um, in itself was one of the reasons. Um, I also think that, um, you know, a animals are closer to humans and um, we tend to anthropomorphize uh, what happens in animals where we don't see ourselves that easily as close to plants. So I think for the, for the general public, um, I don't think they worry so much about gene editing um, crops as they might think about livestock a little longer. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. And I think we kind of saw that tendency, even with GMOs, right, that um, livestock was definitely seen a little differently by the general public. Um, so we've got another question here. Is there a potential for the use of gene editing for methane reduction slash feed use efficiency? Uh, for methane reduction, um, yeah, it's 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 possible. I don't, you know, for editing, you need to understand the mechanisms involved. You need to understand the the genes that are involved and the the gene pathways. I think that was well understood with um, PERS resistance. Um, I don't. What one thing that um, you can say about? I should have made this. Um, should have included this in my slide for when you might not gene edit, but when there's a trait that's controlled by several genes across the genome, it's so much more difficult, right? You don't want to have to edit, you know, 10 genes to get the same effect. So in those kind of cases where it's more polygenic in nature, that's where you probably would turn to regular genomic selection. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that's what we have done with our, you know, um, methane efficient dairy cow, our methane efficient Holstein. Um, we've just used traditional genomic selection uh, and that that works perfectly fine. So I don't I wouldn't list that as one of my targets because it's so polygenic in nature. Certainly, yeah. Um, and being kind of a political hot button issue, I'm, I'm glad that that question came up, certainly. Um, so we have another question here. And though they are not livestock, gene edited mosquitoes have been released that produce no fertile female offspring. The benefit is a reduction in malaria and other diseases. Do you think this will help society at large become comfortable with gene editing and make regulations of livestock somewhat easier? 
I hope so. I mean, I, I, this is another one I'm rooting for. Um, it answers a, you know, a need. Um, there, it's very safe. I mean, they're, they've built in several mechanisms that uh, prevent it from spreading beyond the target um, population. Um, and it's, uh, it would be a very low cost way to, uh, to reduce malaria. Um, you know, and, and the, the other opportunities to keep malaria under control are costly and it involves spraying pesticides, you know, and, and if we can cut down the use of pesticides, um, that would be wonderful um, and would probably be safer for, for humans and animals um, to, to be able to take an approach that's much more targeted. So that's another great example uh, mm -hmm. of use of gene editing. Love it. Mosquitoes as a bit of a gateway to gene editing. Um, and certainly when it affects human health too, right? That kind of maybe helps uh, get the public's mind around that, certainly. Um, so we have another question here, and uh, I'm I'm not sure exactly um, where your expertise lies in this, but the question is, what AI will, what role will AI play in this area in future? Um, I'm assuming that they're talking, uh, the questioner is talking about artificial intelligence. Um, We're going to use that definition. Yeah, not, let's not, go not uh, yeah, artificial insemination, but art, artificial intelligence. Um, you know, is such a buzzword, and it's uh, the possibilities are large. Um, I think um, the way I think about this is the same way, perhaps, that um, pharma companies are thinking about AI, and I think it comes down to really understanding, you know, the pathways involved, the genes involved, and trying to select targets that would be. Uh, good candidates, um, and and I think it uh, artificial intelligence uh, can just run through more scenarios than than I think uh, a team of scientists could. So maybe that's how it might be used um, for gene editing, is in a in a similar way as looking for targets. Certainly. Um, like you said, it's it's a really hot button issue right now. And I think it's something that we see. Um, I think that how will AI impact it is a question that could be applied to just about any topic right now. We've got one more um, Mike McMorris question that I've got to throw at you here. So he asked, the different livestock sectors have very different genetic improvement models. For example, poultry controlled by a couple of companies versus beef, where we have tens of thousands of producers involved. How do you see GE adoption being affected by this diversity? Yeah, um, great question, as always. Um, so when you have larger companies, um, you know, more consolidated industry, particularly if they're vertically integrated, uh, like the swine and the poultry industry are getting to be more vertically integrated, then uh, you can see those those industries having an advantage because you could see how value would be created and captured. Um, beef industry is more of, is like the other end of the spectrum where the, the connectivity um, between one part of the supply chain and, and the, like say from uh, a cow calf operator or from a, a, a dairy producer who's producing dairy beef, um, you know, the signals coming, they just don't come back from, let's say the feedlot or, or from the slaughter plant. So it's harder for, for the, the value to be, um, captured and recognized uh, from the from the start to the end so there there's a natural challenge in trying to uh, capture value from innovation not to say that it can't happen uh, and not to say that you know the beef industry wouldn't be more vertically integrated dairy industry somewhere in between that we don't have the, the big deep pyramids that you see in swine and poultry but um, uh, it's still, um, you know, probably going to to take a very good gene or very good application to make that justification. And and a lot of people feel very strongly about milk and being a very pure product and uh, not necessarily wanted to 
alter that in any way that consumers might not consider to be considered natural. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's there's a there's a barrier there as well in the dairy industry. And I'm curious, I'm going to ask you to maybe um, go out on a limb here, but are there any lessons learned from the regulatory process and public perceptions around GMO that we can use to apply to gene editing when it comes to what we at Elric call getting research into practice or GRIP, otherwise uh, might be called KTT or knowledge mobilization? So what can we learn from GMOs? Um, gosh, there's a lot we can learn on how not to do things. Um, you know, I think, um, and we're probably still guilty of this, but uh, scientists, we get very excited about new technologies and we want to uh, come up with good reasons and, you know, uh, lots of projects that we could do. It's almost like, uh, you know, a hammer looking for a nail. Um, but we should not overpromise, and we shouldn't understate the risks. Uh, if there are risks, we need to call them out. And if you don't call out the risks, and if you overpromise, then you lose credibility, um, and that catches up. And I think that was hap that happened in the GMO scenario where um, we overpromised and uh, maybe didn't talk about the risks as much as as could have been. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is who takes the risk and who gets the benefit. And sometimes it's not always clear that the, the person taking the risk is not the same person that's receiving the benefit. And that uh, creates a problem for the person that's getting the, or is uh, experiencing the risk because they're, they see all, all risk, all downside, no upside. So uh, yeah, there's, there's plenty of, there's probably a, plenty more uh, things we can learn. Um, you can't just um, you can't just use science to explain um, why this is the right thing to do. I think you also have to talk about um, why, like why do you want to do this? Not so much how you're going to do it, but but why is it important to do this? And you know, I guess if we have good uh, KTT folks um, and we can adequately explain that, that would be more ideal. Great. Well, I'm just looking at the time here and it looks like we've managed to wrap up all the questions. So hugely appreciate you taking the time, Dr. Loheis, to be on with us. I know you're very busy in your day-to-day -day work. So this is uh, this was great having you along. Um, like Jean said at the top of the webinar, the recording will be made available and posted to our website within the next day or two. And so, yeah, just a tremendous thank you from everyone at Elric and thanks to the participants for uh, making the time to be part of this today. Thank you.